This week on the Lectures in History podcast, a discussion about the Red Scare, which resulted in widespread fear of a potential rise in communism. University of California Davis history professor Catherine Olmsted describes how the Red Scare evolved into a wide-ranging conspiracy theory in the United States during the 1940s and 1950s. Wyndham Hotels and Resorts makes travel possible for all. Whether it's the long haulers looking for a great cup of coffee, a roomier rest for the on-a-wim road trippers, or a place to make summer memories with the whole family. No matter who you are, where you're going, or why, with 24 trusted brands to choose from like La Quinta, Days Inn, and Super 8, your Wyndham is waiting. Get the lowest price at WyndhamHotels.com. Restrictions apply. Visit website for more details. Good afternoon. So we have talked this quarter about conspiracy theories in U.S. history. We talked about conspiracy theories in the 19th century, which mainly focused on secret societies and on marginalized groups, particularly religious minorities. And then we talked about how in the 20th century there's this pivot as Americans become more afraid of conspirators in the U.S. government, and the U.S. government itself becomes the focus of their fears. Right. Our topic for today is the Red Scare, uh, the fear of communists infiltrating various institutions in American life in the late 1940s and 1950s. Fear of communists in entertainment, communists in the government, and communists in education. Right. So that's our topic for today. Now, as you know, this is the second Red Scare in U.S. history. We talked earlier about the first Red Scare, which happened right after the Bolshevik Revolution in Russia. There was fear in the United States that there could be a similar revolution here. Right. The second Red Scare it lasts much longer and is much more consequential than the first Red Scare. Right. So as I'm talking about it today, I want you to keep a couple of questions in the back of your mind. Uh, first of all, is this really a conspiracy theory? Should we be considering this in a conspiracy theory class? Because as we'll discuss, there were some real Soviet spies in the U.S. government in the 1930s and during World War II. So if there was a real conspiracy, should you call it a conspiracy theory? If there were, were real witches, should you call it a witch hunt? So I'm going to argue that it is a conspiracy theory, and the reason is that some of the leading, uh, some of the leaders in the Red Scare, some of the most extreme anti-communists, made a leap in their logic that we're familiar with by now in studying conspiracy theories. Remember, we talked about Richard Hofstetter and his famous essay, The Paranoid Style in American Politics, and how he identified that in every example of what he called the paranoid style, or what we would call a conspiracy theory, there's a leap from the undeniable to the unbelievable. That there's a leap in argument from fact, 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 undeniable fact to, and therefore there's a secret cabal controlling the world. And so what I'm going to look at today in part is how, when, who made those leaps in logic that leap from the undeniable to the unbelievable. So that's one question to keep in, in the back of your mind, is what makes this a conspiracy theory? Uh, another question I'd like you to keep in mind is, so what? What's the significance? We've talked a lot this quarter about uh, why Americans believe conspiracy theories at particular points, points in history. And I think that's very important for historians to get a window into history, to look at why people believe them, to really empathize with the people of the past and say what motivates them. But also, when we're studying conspiracy theories, I think we need to look at the effects. What are the effects of uh, these widespread beliefs? What effects, what were the main effects of the Red Scare? Why did it matter? And then finally, of course, as always, when you're studying the past, a good question to ask yourself is, are there any lessons that we can learn from this episode in the past that will help us better understand the present? Okay. All right. So with that, let me begin 
with a little bit of context before the late 1940s. I want to begin this story by talking about the Communist Party in the United States at its peak popularity, its moment of peak popularity in the 1930s. So about a decade, a decade and a half before the Red Scare. So uh, the U.S. Communist Party, the Communist Party of the USA, had its heyday, its peak popularity, its, its uh, biggest moment of appeal and attractiveness to Americans in the 1930s. At that time, there were, by 1938, about 100,000 Americans who were card-carrying members of the Communist Party. They signed party cards. They were capital C communists. And if you belonged to the party, it was quite demanding. They had dues that were very expensive, um, and you had to go to three or four meetings a week. So about 100,000 people, Americans, who did that. In addition, there's about a million Americans who are close to the party but don't join the party because it is such a demanding organization. But they sympathize with the party, um, and they consider themselves, you know, small-c communists. They join the party in the Great Depression because it's the Great Depression. They look around uh, their uh, country, and they see high unemployment, poverty, uh, inequality, racism. And so they believed that they were living through a moment in world history that Karl Marx had predicted. You know, Marx believed there were three phases in history. There was feudalism, and there was capitalism. Capitalism would have a big crisis, and then there would be communism. And so when they looked around in the Great Depression, they said, well, obviously, this is the moment. This is the crisis of, of capitalism. We will now move to a communist society. And they believed the party's rhetoric about how it would lead to economic equality and end uh, racism and social injustice. All right, so I don't want to make, I don't want to exaggerate the appeal because there's 132 million people living in the United States at this time, about a million communists, you know, that's less than 1%. But still, it's a million people, it's a significant social movement. All right, uh, who are these communists? Well, they're all over the United States. This is a picture of a May Day parade in Sacramento in 1934. Sacramento had a very visible, vibrant, energetic uh, communist party. We had lots of marches and parades and protests. Uh, There were also uh, very visible communist party events in Los Angeles, in San Francisco, in the San Joaquin Valley. That's in California, rural and urban California, all over the nation. There were rural and urban areas where you could find very active communist parties. Who were the communists? Well, mostly they were people who were marginalized. So uh, very poor people, uh, coal miners, farm workers, factory workers, people who were most disadvantaged by the Depression. Also, they were disproportionately immigrant, disproportionately Jewish immigrants. Um, There were, however, some people in these 100,000 members of the party who were professionals or intellectuals, who were teachers, professors, screenwriters, government officials. All right, so during this period of the 1930s, when the Communist Party reaches its, its peak in popularity, Um, There still is anti-communism in American life. You can find uh, books like this that are published. This is called The Red Network. It's published by a woman who's essentially a professional anti-communist, where she lists people who she believes are communist in American life. Lots of books like this. You can go to anti-communist speeches, find anti-communist articles in the newspaper. So it isn't like anti-communism disappears during the Great Depression, It doesn't even disappear during World War II when the Soviet Union is allied with the United States in fighting the Axis powers. But it is more submerged. Like it surges during the first Red Scare and then uh, it significantly decreases, but there are still active anti-communists throughout the interwar period. Then World War II ends in 1945. 
and after the war ended, there are signs that there's going to be a resurgence of anti-communism. One of the first signs is that there are several political candidates around the country who run for office in 1946. So this is the year after the war ended. Uh, They run for office in 1946 and make as one of their uh, primary themes the dangers that the nation faces from domestic communism, that there are enemies within who are communists, secret communists, former communists, people who are working secret, Americans who are working secretly with the Soviet Union. One example of this sort of anti-communist who runs for office in 1946 is Richard Nixon, uh, who runs for the first time for political office. He's a lawyer and Navy veteran in Orange County in 1946. He runs for Congress, his first elected office in 1946, And one of his major themes is that his opponent, who's a liberal Democrat, is actually secretly helping the communists, has communist sentiments, and is therefore a danger. So Nixon wins in 1946. There are several other members of Congress who get elected that year who are starting to make this uh, a theme. So that's 1946. Then in 1947... There are several events that provide the context for a resurgence of anti-communism. One has to do with a global context. President Harry Truman in 1947 uh, proclaimed his Truman Doctrine, in which he said that the United States would support free peoples all over the world. He defined free peoples as people fighting communism. So in 1947, the Cold War has really begun. The United States has declared that it is going to fight communism all over the globe. It's obviously important context for understanding the fear of communism at home. Uh, Truman also, in 1947, starts a loyalty program for government workers, which means that you can only work for the federal government if you swear loyalty to the U.S. Constitution and the FBI... Uh, conducts background checks on people who are working for the federal government. This loyalty program begins with Truman. Over the years, it becomes much more extensive and intensive, much more stringent criteria uh, over the next decade or so. But it does begin in 1947. Yes, question? Do you need to move the mic for him or not? Where was the Socialist Party during this time? Did they have more members, and what was their relationship to the Communist Party? The Socialist Party um, was very um, uh, hostile to the Communist Party. The Socialist Party believed that the Communist Party was uh, making it much more difficult for leftists in the United States. The Socialist Party was not connected to the Soviet Union and was committed to democracy and to peaceful transition to socialism. So socialists tended to be very hostile to the communists. It, the socialists did exist, but they're not at all in league with the communists. All right, so this is 1947, and it is 1947 that we get our first um, uh, major episode in what would be called the Red Scare, when there is a big investigation into alleged subversives, communists in the entertainment industry, particularly in the film industry. It's in 1947 that the House Un-American Activities Committee goes to Hollywood to hold hearings to investigate the extent of communist infiltration of the film industry. Anti-communists by 1947 are increasingly worried that the media have been corrupted, particularly the entertainment media, and that domestic communists have infiltrated the film industry, later the TV industry, the radio industry, and are using their positions in the entertainment industry to create entertainment that will weaken American resistance to communism. 
or even convince Americans to become communists, that they're molding American lives. And so the House Un-American Activities Committee, which had been around since the 1930s, looking at fascists and communists in the United States, by 1947 has become exclusively focused on communist subversion in the United States. And they decide there's such a danger of communists infiltrating the film industry that they take the whole committee, the Congressional Committee from Washington, D.C., to Hollywood to hold hearings, to investigate, hold hearings to investigate the extent of communist infiltration of the film industry. Now, it's true that there were some communists in the film industry, people mostly behind the camera, who had either were either still Communist Party members, a lot more who had been Communist Party members, but were not anymore. There's not a lot of evidence that they were able to influence the kind of movies that were built, that were built, that were, that were uh, produced. Um, the movie industry is very uh, capitalist. The studios are huge. They're trying to make money. There's not really... The, the investigators can't find evidence of communist propaganda in the movies. They, there are three movies that were made during World War II about the valor of the Soviets when the U.S. was allied with the Soviet Union, but that's not so much because there's communists in the movie industry as the movie industry executives wanted to curry favor with the U.S. government and say, look how uh, patriotic we are. We're showing these, uh, we're making these movies about our Soviet allies. But nevertheless, the House and American Activities Committee is convinced that in the future, there could be this danger. So they come to Hollywood. Um, they started out by uh, having people testify who are called friendly witnesses. This included the actor Ronald Reagan. These were people in the industry who sympathized with the committee. They're friendly. Then they go to unfriendly witnesses, people who have been accused of being communists. Uh, and those witnesses are extremely unfriendly. They're hostile. And in some cases, they start shouting at the committee members. There are 10 in particular, here's a picture of seven of them, walking up the steps of the courthouse, who become known as the Hollywood 10 because they completely refuse to cooperate with the committee. Uh, and they protest that they should not have to testify about their political beliefs, that the First Amendment protects them. So they cite the First Amendment, refuse to cooperate with the committee. They believe that the Supreme Court will back them up on this, but it turns out they're wrong, and eventually they lose their appeals and they get sent to prison. Now, the Hollywood 10 case has a chilling effect on the rest of Hollywood because it becomes clear, first of all, that you can't cite the First Amendment, um, and second, that you face real dangers if you refuse to cooperate. Now, another option available to people who actually were communists in the 1930s is to take the Fifth Amendment before the committee so that when the committee says, are you now or have you ever been a member of the Communist Party, you can say, I refuse to testify on the grounds that uh, my answer might incriminate me. This the court allows. It is constitutional. They can refuse to testify based on the Fifth Amendment. But if they take the Fifth Amendment, then they are blacklisted. They're not sent to prison because it's legal to take uh, the Fifth Amendment. Uh, but they do, but they do uh, end up on a blacklist. What this means is if you're on the blacklist, you can't get work. Um, and for the blacklist expands to be about 300 people, and it lasts for more than a decade. Now, one of the reasons that these people refuse to cooperate, even if they no longer support the Communist Party, is if they cooperate, they are pressed to name everyone that they can think of that they saw at a party meeting. So if you answer truthfully and say, yes, I was a communist in 1935, but only briefly and I'm not anymore, they would keep asking you 
until you named everybody that you saw at the last party meeting. So in order to avoid that, in order to become, to avoid being a ref- informer, these people take the Fifth Amendment and then they end up losing their jobs. There's the black list, which is the official list of people who take the Fifth Amendment. There's also uh, what some people informally call the gray list. This is a list of hundreds of more names of people who lose their jobs in Hollywood because they're suspected of having leftist sympathies. They never actually get called before the committee, but the movie industry suspects them of making the movie industry vulnerable to these HUAC House and American Activities Committee uh, investigations. Yes? Question? That because it's like a house committee, how they're able to affect Hollywood, which is like a separate industry on its own. And if people like higher up in Hollywood are sitting on the house committee, because how do you just prevent an industry from hiring people? That's a really good question. Um, one thing that the uh, congressional committees can do is threaten legislation. Like, we will pass laws that have official censorship if you don't get your house in order. Uh, The other is that they can use their political power as politicians, as representatives in Congress, to organize boycotts. And so the the movie industry is frightened, and they decide, okay, what we're going to do is try and appease this committee. And one way we can appease it is to set up these blacklists. Yeah, very good question. All right, so there's the blacklist, there's the gray list, there's also... um, among people who are left, who don't lose their jobs, there's an avoidance of edgy topics. This is especially true after 1951, when there's another major HUAC investigation of Hollywood, and the movie industry gets really scared. And they decide, you know what we should do is not make any movies that can be construed in the least sense of having communist sympathies. So, no movies about poverty, about labor struggle, about racism, you know. And so the, the, the people who are left in the industry tend to produce movies that are much more conformist, much more conservative than movies in the past. So it not only affects Hollywood by having all these people lose their jobs, but the people who are left are determined to make a certain kind of movie that are either apolitical or conservative. And then finally, there's some of the studios respond by making overtly anti-communist films. Again, in an attempt to uh, appeal to HUAC and prove their patriotism. Uh, So there are a whole slew in the 1950s of films about the evils of the Communist Party. Um, One of the best, there's a whole lot of really bad ones that I would not recommend to you. But if you're interested in a good one, this is from 1962, The Manchurian Candidate. Um, and I'm mentioning this one in particular because not only is it a good movie, but it, it sets this um, idea of a Manchurian candidate that we'll see again and again in conspiracy theories. The basic plot of the movie is that an American soldier is kidnapped during the Korean War and taken to Manchuria where he is brainwashed and programmed to be an assassin by the communists. Then they release him, he goes back to the United States, and he is set up to kill a presidential candidate. And once he kills the presidential candidate, then the path will be cleared to the presidency for another politician who is controlled by the Soviet Union. So it is a very clever 1962 anti-communist movie showing the evils of communism and also setting up this idea that you'll see again and again in American entertainment of uh, brainwashed Americans who, are, who the communists can use for all kinds of evil purposes. Okay. All right, so the Red Scare has this big effect in Hollywood starting in 1947 through the 1950s. There is also, of course, in this era, a great fear of communism in the government, And this fear really takes off a year after the Hollywood hearings. It takes off in 1948 because two defectors, 
two ex-communists come forward and tell their stories in very dramatic ways. And their stories convince Americans that there are, the U.S. government is, is filled with communists. Right, so let me talk about each of these defectors and their stories. Right. This is the first one. Her name was Elizabeth Bentley. She went public in 1948 to reveal that she had been in charge of a Soviet spy ring in the United States from 1938 to 1945. Now, who was she and how had she gotten involved in Soviet spying? All right, so Elizabeth Bentley was from a very old American family. She claimed she had an ancestor who came over on the Mayflower. Certainly her family had been in Connecticut for generations. She was Protestant, she was middle class, she was Republican. She, when, when, time, when it was time to go to college, she went to Vassar, prestigious women's college. Then she went to Columbia University for her master's. And in the middle of the 1930s, she finished her master's at Columbia, found herself in New York City, and she decided to join the Communist Party. She joined the Communist Party, presumably for the same reason that 100,000 other Americans did at that time, for the reasons that she believed it would be the best way to get social justice in the United States. Right. She joined the Communist Party, but then she did something that 99.5% of American communists did not do, and that is that she also became a Soviet spy. She became a Soviet spy by volunteering herself. You know, she was educated. She knew how to do these things. So she went to the Communist Party headquarters in New York City and said, I would like to be a spy. I imagine... Communist Party headquarters people, that you have contacts with Soviet spies, I would like to be one. And her pitch to them was that she was Elizabeth Bentley from Connecticut, from Vassar, middle class, Protestant. Nobody, she said, is going to suspect me because there are these, oh, excuse me, these stereotypes of communists, of being immigrants and Jews and poor people. Oh, nobody's going to suspect me of being a communist. And uh, so they put her in contact with the Soviet spy service, which I'll call the KGB. Changed its name a few times in this era, but it became the KGB. So she becomes a Soviet intelligence agent, a KGB agent. Um, And they turned her over to a KGB operative in New York City. His name was Jacob Golos. And he trained her to be a Soviet spy. He trained her with, you know, disappearing ink and how to check if somebody's tailing you. (laughs) Dead drops, everything you've read about in spy novels or seen in spy movies. He trained her with these things, and they fell in love. And she moved in with him. They lived together from 1938 to 1943 until his death. He was the great love of her life. Yeah. Then he suddenly died in 1943 of a heart attack. He was a lot older than she was, but still it was quite unexpected. He died, and the Soviets then put her in charge of his spy network. They didn't usually trust women with jobs like that, but she knew the work. She had worked for him. She knew the job, and it was a war. They were distracted, so they let her take over. They almost immediately regretted it, however, what she did for them was that she managed Golos's agents, Americans who worked for the KGB. There were about 30 of them. Some of them were in industry. They stole, stole, stole industrial secrets, like film processing techniques for the Soviets. Um, some of them were in the government, mid-level bureaucrats in places like the Bureau of Economic Warfare. So she managed his, his uh, agents, and she continued to manage them after he died, but she got more and more disillusioned when she was working directly with a KGB instead of with her lover and uh, began to wonder if she was on the right side. So uh, she started drinking a lot. Drinking was always a problem for her. Drinking a lot, uh, having a lot of sexual partners, going to bars and hooking up with guys. The Soviets began to worry that this was not 
you know, the best trade craft for a spy. And so uh, she began to pick up on the fact that they were disillusioned with her. Long story short, she decided to defect. She was afraid that the Soviets would assassinate her, and they were talking about doing that to shut her up. Didn't get around to it. She was worried that the FBI was about to catch her, which they weren't. But she was worried about getting caught or getting killed, so she decided to go to the FBI. She went to the FBI, and she gave them a list. Spent three days being debriefed. Named absolutely every person she could think of. Not only the 30 agents who she had mentioned, uh, she had uh, mentored, handled, but also 80 additional names of Americans and Russians. Names that had come up in conversation while she was in the room. So she was a top spy. She had sometimes gone to parties or met with friends of Jacob Golos. And she had heard gossip. So she gave the FBI everything. Sometimes it was fragmentary. Sometimes it was only a first name. But she gave them this long list. Right. So the FBI had this trove of information dropped in their lap. And J. Edgar Hoover, the head of the FBI, tried to keep this information very secret. He didn't even tell the president Bentley's identity. He told the president that there was a defector, but he referred to the defector as Gregory and used he, him pronouns. Tried very hard to keep her identity secret, but he did tell some top British spies, and they told the head of Soviet counterintelligence for the British, the guy in charge of catching Soviet spies for the British. His name was Kim Philby, and he was a Soviet spy. He was a mole. So almost instantly, the Soviets knew that she had defected. All right, so I tell this story about Philby, not just because it's an interesting story in intelligence history, but also it's very significant because essentially what the Soviets learned immediately after Bentley had defected was that all of their spies in the United States were potentially vulnerable. Not only the people she had directly managed, but anybody she might have encountered or gossip that she might have heard. And so in 1945, the Soviets try to shut down their intelligence networks in North America. There's very little Soviet spying in the United States after 1945 because of Bentley's defection. Now, what that means is when Americans start getting really afraid of Soviet spies and worried about Soviet spies in 1948... There's very little Soviet spying that's actually going on. It's historical by that point. Okay. All right. So she worked for them. Bentley worked for them uh, for the FBI then as a double agent, trying to gather evidence against the people that she accused of being Soviet spies. Doesn't get anywhere because they all know that she's working for the FBI. But she worked as a double agent. By about 1947, she started getting restless. Um, the FBI paid her, but not very much. And she starts noticing, you know, it's a Cold War, Truman Doctrine, loyalty program, uh, HUAC hearings in Hollywood. People are really afraid of communism. And she also starts noticing that there are a lot of ex-communists, people who are apostates, have left the Communist Party, who are writing best-selling books about the dangers of communism. In many of the cases, these people who write the memoirs and get paid to give lectures, they aren't, they were never big players in the Communist Party. They're nobodies. Yet they're selling books about, I was a communist. So she thinks, you know what? I have a good story. (laughs) I have a story that is going to sell books because I was not only a communist, I was a spy. So she goes to the FBI and says, I want to go public and sell my story. And they said, no, 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 no. Uh, And she didn't listen. She seldom listened to authority figures. And so in 1948, she decided to go to the newspapers and tell her story in hopes of monetizing it. Her goal is she will then write her memoir, earn a lot of money, go on the paid lecture circuit as an ex-communist. In other words, this conspiracy theory about communism in America and the threat of domestic communism exists before she goes public. She just recognizes that there's an opportunity 
to pour fuel on the flames. All right, so she went to the newspapers. They told her story very sensationalistically. She's a red spy queen. She's the blonde queen. She's the mystery blonde. Um, Then she was called to Congress to testify. So here she is again testifying before Congress. She told her story to Congress. One key problem she has is that she has no documentation. She didn't take any documents with her when she defected. So she's got no proof for her story. So at that point, the people on the House and American Activities Committee who wanted to believe her, who wanted to support her story, decide to call to testify another defector to back her up. And so this is where we get the story of the second defector, Whitaker Chambers. So Whitaker Chambers was known to members of the House Un-American Activities Committee in 1948 when Bentley was testifying uh, because he was a well-connected journalist uh, on the right. He was known throughout Washington as someone who was an admitted ex-communist. He said he had been a communist in the 1930s. He had realized how evil communism was, and now he was working against communism. He had told many people that he knew secret communists in the U.S. government in the 1930s. So the House Un-American Activities Committee called him after Bentley's testimony to ask him to tell his story and essentially to affirm that what she said made sense. He had never met her. But he said, first of all, I think she's telling the truth because I, too, was a secret communist. At this point, he doesn't say he was a spy. He says, I was a secret communist. I knew secret communists in the U.S. government. So her story sounds plausible to me. That's all he's asked to testify to at the beginning is, is her story plausible? Chambers has an advantage in telling his story that Bentley did not. And that is that he has the ability to name names that people in Washington have heard. Now, Bentley's sources were, as I said, mid-level bureaucrats, mostly in the Bureau of Economic Warfare. It's hard to get excited about that. This person you never heard of in this bureau you never heard of was a communist spy. But Chambers is able to name a couple of people that well-connected insiders have heard of. Right? And the most important of these names is Alger Hiss. So insiders in Washington, political journalists, members of Congress, congressional staff members, have heard of Alger Hiss. He's a name that's familiar. That's because Alger Hiss had been in the State Department for several years. He was not the Secretary of State, but he advised the Secretary of State. Uh, And he was connected with a couple of events that got a lot of fresh press coverage. He was with the State Department delegation that went to Yalta with Franklin Roosevelt. Yalta was the summit, the last summit of World War II, but where Roosevelt was still alive. And it was controversial because a lot of conservatives by 1948 believed that Roosevelt had sold out Poland at Yalta, right? So Alger Hiss was known as somebody who went to Yalta and advised President Roosevelt. Alger Hiss is also known as an American who helped set up the United Nations. He's one of several State Department employees who helped organize the first conference of the United Nations. A lot of conservatives don't like the United Nations because they're nationalists. They're America firsters. They think that the U.S. is is ceding some of its power to an outside force with the United Nations. So he's associated with a couple of things that that anti-communists already hate. He's no longer in government at this point. He's working for a nonprofit. But nevertheless, this revelation that Alger Hiss was a secret communist in the 1930s has the symbolic resonance. Because if Alger Hiss was a communist, again, like Bentley's white Anglo Saxon Protestant, good family, his case, Harvard, you know, knows everyone. If he's a communist, then how can you tell who a communist is? They might be hiding everywhere. They might be influencing the Secretary of State. They might be influencing important uh, decisions like those made at Yalta. 
All right, so Alter Hiss, naming Alter Hiss as a secret communist was a big deal. He was called to testify. He insisted uh, that uh, Chambers was lying. He said, I never even met this guy. He's totally making this up. And he was so insistent that Chambers was out to destroy him that Hiss then decided to sue Chambers for slander. Get money for him for the consequences of lying about Hiss. So it was at that point when Chambers uh, sued Hiss that uh, Chambers decided to change his story. And he said, actually, up until this point, I have been defending Alter Hiss. I have been protecting him because it's not true when I said he was just a secret communist. He was also a spy. I confess that I was a spy. I managed agents, just like Elizabeth Bentley did. This was back in the mid-1930s. I was a manager of communist agents in the U.S. government, and Alger Hiss was one of my agents. Right? So suddenly it's, it's, a much more, it's a much bigger story. It's not just that Alger Hiss, the New Dealer, the guy at Yalta, the U.N. guy, is a secret communist, but also he's a Soviet spy. Chambers also said... I have not revealed up until this point, but I have proof for this, because when I was a spy, which by now is, you know, over a decade ago, I saved documents. I figured the Soviets might come after me, so I told them I had a life preserver. I had documents that proved my story, both print documents and microfilm, and I have hidden them, and if I die in a weird car accident, they're going to be revealed. So he tells the committee this. And uh, he had saved these documents with a friend. And then right before he revealed them, he took the microfilm and hid it in a pumpkin, a hollowed out pumpkin on his farm in Maryland. So late at night, he then led the investigators out on this hike through his pumpkin patch on his Maryland farm to this pumpkin. It's hollowed out. He lifts off the lid and inside is microfilm. Microfilm of Soviet, uh, sorry, of State Department documents from the 1930s, some with Alger Hiss's handwriting on them. So he took this back. The House Un-American Activities Committee then had a big press conference, proof of Soviet espionage in the Roosevelt White House. And of course, the person on the House Un-American Activities Committee who is most happy about this is Richard Nixon, who has been talking about the dangers of domestic communism since 1946. Now, it is just two years into his career, and he has helped to prove that there was this significant Soviet spy in the Roosevelt White House. So I love this picture of Nixon because he's posing for the press here. He has the microfilm, and he has um, uh, a magnifying glass to read the microfilm. You can't actually read microfilm with, with a magnifying glass, right? But it makes a nice picture, right? And he becomes a rising star from this point on. And on the issue of the communist threat. Okay, Alger Hiss was then uh, tried, had two trials actually, the second one, the first one was a hung jury, the second one he was convicted. Right. So now you have two pieces of information about communism in the government. One is Elizabeth Bentley and her people in the government till 1945. Now Alger Hiss has been convicted of being a Soviet spy. Uh, There's one other spy case that comes out in 1950 that I will discuss very briefly here, but it is an important part of the story. This is a picture of Ethel and Julius Rosenberg. They were uh, arrested in the summer of 1950 for allegedly stealing the secret of the atomic bomb. Uh, This was a case that came out of a British investigation. The British had discovered that one of their scientists in the Manhattan Project to build the bomb during the war had been giving information to the Soviets. So the British were able to identify this British scientist. He then named some names that led them eventually to Ethel and Julius Rosenberg. Uh, The information from the British scientists probably helped the Soviets get a bomb quicker than they would have otherwise, maybe one to four years faster than if they had not gotten information. So the British spy in the Manhattan Project was important. 
Ethel and Julius Rosenberg were really not important in the atomic story. Julius was a spy, and Ethel knew that he was a spy. He stole some important uh, military information. Right? But they're arrested in 1950, they're accused of stealing the secret of the atomic bomb, and they were executed in 1953. Okay, so... For people who are afraid of, government, of communists in the government, you have the Bentley case, the Hiss case, and now the Rosenberg case. It seems to be evidence for yet more uh, subversion. So what are the effects? Well, what happens is first President Truman and then his successor, President Eisenhower, expand the loyalty program. It becomes a loyalty security program which means it's not enough for you just to uh, swear that you're loyal to the U.S. government, the FBI will try to determine if you are a security threat. So it's your loyalty, and also, do you uh, threaten U.S. security? Many more FBI investigations. Uh, As these investigations go forward, about 3,000 federal workers lost their jobs in the loyalty probes. Uh, Were some of these people communist spies? Maybe. The vast majority of them were people who at some point in their past, their remote past or their past, closer past, had some contact with some aspect of the American left. They had been in the party or they had been in the Socialist Party or they had been in the Progressive Party or they had worked for unionization or they had... um, you know, worked uh, in pacifist groups, or they subscribed to the wrong magazines, or they went to the wrong bookstores, or they were denounced by their co-workers for saying things that seemed disloyal. Right? So about 3,000 workers were then um, fired as a result of these uh, loyalty probes. An even bigger effect was what was called the Lavender Scare, because soon, as this loyalty security program expanded, uh, the U.S. government decided that people who were gay or who appeared to be gay were a threat to national security. Uh, So this is called the Lavender Scare. It had even more victims than the Red Scare. About 5,000 federal workers lost their jobs uh, for being queer. The federal government, the Federal Bureau of Investigation looked into their background and decided that they were a security risk because of their sexuality or their gender presentation. The reason for this given, as was stated here in this uh, Senate committee report, was those who engage in overt acts of perversion, as they call it, lack the emotional stability of normal persons. Uh, and that one homosexual can pollute a government office, that they were vulnerable to blackmail, and also that because they were allegedly, you know, perverted, they were morally weak and could be um, put to use by the Soviets. All right, so that's an effect, is that these people are then purged from the federal government. The final point I want to make about communists and the government is the way that the issue was weaponized by one particular uh, U.S. senator who gave his name to this era, Joseph McCarthy. Uh, Joseph McCarthy, this is often called the McCarthy era, McCarthyism, because he was the most reckless proponent of uh, these accusations. He was pretty late, though, to the to the party, to the conspiracy theory. Um, He was elected to Senate, to the Senate from Wisconsin in 1946. Uh, And for the first four years that he was in the Senate, he did not make anti-communism a big issue. But then in 1950, right after Alger Hiss was convicted, and he realized that this was a fear uh, that a lot of Americans held, that there were communists in the government... In 1950, he suddenly decided to become the leader of the people who charged that there was communism in the government. So he burst into the public eye in February of 1950 when he went to West Virginia to give a speech. 
And at the speech, he waved this piece of paper over his head and said, I have here in my hand a list of 205, a list of names that were made known to the Secretary of State as being members of the Communist Party and who nevertheless are still working and shaping policy in the State Department. So how is this different? How is this an escalation from what Elizabeth Bentley or Whitaker Chambers were saying? What do you identify as being the new accusation here? Yes? That they were known to the State Department. That they were known to the State Department, yes. And Chambers is talking about the mid-1930s, and Bentley is talking about up until 1945. What, what McCarthy is saying is right now, 1950, this very moment, we have communists in the State Department. Hundreds of communists in the State Department alone. And the State Department knows, the Secretary of State knows. Why is he letting 200 known communists operate in the State Department? Well, he must be a communist spy himself. He must be a communist agent. Right? Now, he made this up. He didn't have a list. Right? And he would go on to make these uh, unfounded, reckless accusations for the next several years. Uh, at his peak, um, this was... Uh, the conspiracy theory that he offered. This was in 1951, a speech on the floor of the Senate in which he said uh, he started talking about all of the foreign policy reversals that the United States had suffered. The communists won the Civil War in China. The Soviets tested an atomic bomb. And he said, how can we account for our present situation unless we believe that men high in this government are concerning to deliver us to disaster? This must be the product of a great conspiracy, a conspiracy on a scale so immense as to dwarf any such venture in the history of man. A conspiracy of infamy so black when it is finally exposed, its principles shall be forever deserving of the maledictions of all honest men. It's a conspiracy that goes all the way to the top, biggest conspiracy in world history. It is a conspiracy in which the U.S. government is filled with, honeycombed with traitors who are working actively to uh, make sure that the U.S. loses to the communists abroad and eventually that communism takes over the United States. So this is his big leap, right? You have some undeniable facts. There are Soviet spies in the government, Soviet spies in the military, especially during World War II when the U.S. was allied with the Soviet Union. Now McCarthy is saying, and... And in addition, they're still here. They're dominating the government. The Secretary of the State and the Secretary of Defense are their tools. Okay. All right, any questions about communism in the government? All right, okay, let me now turn to the last segment of American society where there was great fear that the communists uh, had infiltrated and were destroying American society from within. Yes, question? Why 200 bags? It's unclear. He made it up. Yeah. Yeah, people have tried to figure out why he said that. Just grabbed a number out of the hat, out of the air. Okay, so... Uh, Anti-communists worried about communists in education, K-12 education, colleges, universities. They called communist educators reducators. Um, It's a little harder to quantify this than it is to quantify the number of federal employees who lost their jobs because it happens at the local level. In this country, especially then, you know, most education decisions were made at the local level. So you're looking at school districts throughout the United States who who hired and then fired uh, unknown numbers of uh, people because they believed that they were communist. I want to talk about two of the most prominent episodes in this period of fear that the educational institutions of this country had been infiltrated by communists. First of all, the first uh, episode, example happens here in California at the University of California. All right, so in California, in Sacramento, the state government had its own Un-American Activities Committee. 
This happened in a lot of states. You have the, the House Un-American Activities Committee, and then there are many at the state level. In California, the California Un-American Activities Committee was one of the, the most active. It had investigations. It had hearings. It had blacklists. It would pressure uh, both public employers and private employers to fire people because they were suspected of being uh, communist. The California Un-American Activities Committee in the late 1940s pressured the UC Board of Regents to require all faculty, just faculty at that point, to sign an oath, a loyalty oath. And so the UC Regents voted to do this. Um, I put it on the the slide here. Uh, The key part is that they had to swear that they were not a member of the Communist Party in order to keep their job. Now, the UC had, for ever since like 1940, refused to hire anyone who was a communist. So at this point, it was seemed very unlikely that there were any communist professors. If they were, they were secret and presumably weren't going to be disturbed by having to sign an oath. Right? Uh, but the, in 1950, the region said, if you want to keep your job as a UC professor, you have to sign this oath. Uh, There was a big controversy. A lot of professors mobilized to try and resist this. They said, I am not a communist. I have never been a communist, but academic freedom, shared governance, First Amendment, this should not be something that we have to sign. On principle, they said, I will not sign this. So there were about 30 people, 30 professors who refused to sign in the end. There was a big number. It got whittled down as it became clear that they were going to fire you if you didn't sign it. So there were 30 in the end who said, no, I refuse to sign this oath, and so they were fired. Now, over the next several years, they appealed their firings through the courts. Eventually, uh, they were offered the opportunity to get rehired if they signed another oath that some of them found uh, less offensive, right? But they were all fired in 1950, and so this has a chilling effect not only in California but throughout the nation as many uh, public university systems copy the UC loyalty oath. Now, this is a public university, so this controversy took place at a public university. You can see how uh, the state legislature would have a lot of influence over the Board of Regents. But this is true... This fear of communism and the communist firings, the communist inquisitions, also occurred in private universities. And the chief example that I would like to give here at a private university concerns the case of Linus Pauling, the chemist and professor at the California Institute of Technology. All right, so... Let me give you a little bit of background on Linus Pauling so that you understand the stakes of his case. Um, There he is as a young man. Uh, He was brilliant from a very young age, grew up in Oregon, went to Oregon State University at age 16. By age 19, he was teaching the chemistry classes there. He was called the boy professor. Uh, Then he went to Caltech, got his Ph.D. in chemistry, uh, got on the faculty there at age 26, and started producing a lot of field-changing work uh, in uh, chemistry and then biochemistry. His greatest work was called The Nature of the Chemical Bond. Uh, it's, there's the cover page printed there. He starts publishing on the nature of the chemical bond throughout the 1930s. His work on chemical bonding is the most among the most widely cited scientific works of the 20th century. Uh, He then moved on to being really interested in biochemistry and living systems. During World War II, he served the U.S. government. He developed an oxygen meter for submarines that would help determine the level of oxygen in a submarine. Got a presidential medal for that. And then after World War II, he decided to write a chemistry textbook which became one of the most widely assigned chemistry textbook taught generations of chemistry students. This helped him to become independently wealthy. So he was a decorated, renowned, and now wealthy chemist who had helped transform American science. 
in the late 1940s, now that he had his job secure, that he had money, he decided that he would get active in politics. He had never been active in politics before. He was in his lab all the time. But by this point, he's in his late 40s, and he decided, you know, I'm going to start joining some organizations. He joined civil rights organizations. He joins pacifist organizations. And he starts speaking out against the Red Scare. In particular, he comes to the defense of professors who were getting fired because of their refusal to sign loyalty oaths or their supposed communist path. And so he starts speaking out, being a leader of the people, of the professors that are opposed to the Red Scare in education. Um, He uh, starts uh, attracting the attention, as he does this, of this man, J. Edgar Hoover. So Pauling, in becoming this outspoken anti-anti-communist, someone who is saying anti-communism has gone crazy, you are uh, undermining American science and American education uh, by attacking these educators. When he said this, J. Edgar Hoover became convinced that that Pauling must be a communist. He must be doing the Soviets' bidding if he was insisting that the Red Scare in education was wrong or going too far. Um, Hoover was particularly upset when he learned that that Pauling at first refused to to say anything about whether he had ever been in the Communist Party uh, because he said, well, that's just, Pauling said, that's playing into their hands. So I'm I'm just not even going to answer that question. Eventually, Caltech forced him to answer the question, and he said truthfully that he had never been a communist. But Hoover is convinced that's a lie. And so what he started to do was, first of all, he launched a major investigation. The Los Angeles uh, FBI office started interviewing everyone from Pauling's past and in his present, his colleagues, his neighbors. They started interviewing everyone that they knew who had gone to Communist Party meetings in the 1930s in Los Angeles, trying to prove that he had been a communist. Devoted tremendous resources to this. And came up with nothing. We're not able to find a single person who uh, could testify that Pauling had ever been to a meeting or said anything in favor of the communists or the Soviets. Uh, Hoover, though, was convinced that Pauling was just very good at at covering his tracks. He urged the Justice Department to uh, prosecute Pauling for perjury, for, in Hoover's view, lying about being a Communist Party member. Um, he pressured Caltech to begin an investigation of Pauling's uh, politics. Uh, he started pressuring U.S. government agencies and private donors to yank their grants from Pauling's lab. He pressured universities around the country to rescind their speaking invitations so that Pauling could not uh, travel to discuss his research. And then... Hoover, in 1952, worked with the U.S. Passport Office to deny (coughs) Pauling a passport so that he could not travel abroad. Uh, It was at this particular moment that Pauling felt particularly oppressed by the FBI because he really wanted to go to a specific conference in London in 1952 where he was going to see some photographs of of DNA that he believed could help him become the person who discovered the the structure of DNA. He was going to map the double helix structure of DNA. But he couldn't go to that conference. He couldn't work with those British scientists, and so it was a different group of British scientists who discovered the double helix of uh, structure of DNA. So what we have here is another case of a big leap. We have J. Edgar Hoover looking at Linus Pauling and saying, well, he's a leftist. This guy is speaking out against me, and he's speaking out against uh, other anti-communists. All of this is true. Therefore, he must be a Soviet agent. Therefore, I am justified in investigating him and trying to undermine his career. And remember that this is a time in U.S. history when the U.S. is involved in a Cold War with the Soviet Union. It's a competition that's not only military and diplomatic, it's technological. 
It's cultural. And Hoover is willing to undermine one of America's greatest scientists because he so firmly believes this conspiracy theory. All right. Okay. You should not feel too sorry for Linus Pauling because he was able to transcend all of this. In 1954, he was awarded uh, the Nobel Prize in Chemistry. Yes, question? Were any of the people who were publicly sort of like interviewed by Kuvac, were their lives at risk? Was there any chance that someone, some, someone could consider themselves an American patriot would try to kill them? You know, I'm not aware of any story like that. I think what happened more commonly is that they would die by suicide. Oh, and there were people who did uh, take their own lives after they lost um, their work. Um, and, of course, you, there was, not only did you lose your job, but if your neighbors would shun you. But I don't think back then people were as worried about vigilante action against them. Okay, so Linus Pauling he gets the Nobel Prize in 1954. This is for his work on the chemical bond. Um, there he is getting it in Sweden with his three sons. Uh, the U.S. government briefly considered not letting him go to Sweden to collect his prize. Uh, but the Secretary of State then overruled the FBI and said, this is ridiculous. We're going to look. Uh, it's going to be a very bad image for the United States if we don't let our scientists go collect their Nobel Prizes. After he got that Nobel Prize, Linus Pauling was freed. He felt, I have achieved the pinnacle of uh, my career, I can do what I want. And so he got even more politically active. And in particular, he started working against nuclear testing. He used his uh, credibility as a scientist to say that the Soviets and Americans and British who were testing nuclear weapons above ground were causing carcinogens to drift into the atmosphere and causing um, cancer and birth defects. So he worked, he put tremendous amount of energy over the next several years to to lead a movement against nuclear testing. Here's one of the books that he published. I like this cover because you can see how famous he was, No More War by Nobel Prizeman Pauling. That's how they identify him. Okay, that was 1958. He continued on into the 1960s. Here he is at a march asking the British Prime Minister and the American President to stop testing. And ultimately, he succeeded. Uh, he, he won. The U.S., the Soviets, and the British signed a nuclear um, test treaty in 1963 that put the tests underground so that there would not be that toxic fallout anymore. And Pauling uh, believed that this was his greatest achievement He got the Nobel Peace Prize, so his second Nobel Prize uh, for his work against nuclear testing. And he said that, you know, he was very proud of the chemistry uh, prize. On the other hand, the Nobel Peace Prize was an indication to me that I had done my duty as a human being. Okay, so let me wrap this up here uh, by talking about uh, the consequences here. Linus Pauling escaped the consequences of being a target of J. Edgar Hoover's conspiracy theory. He was wealthy. He was well-connected. He was internationally renowned. But most victims of this conspiracy theory were not so lucky. And almost all of Hoover and McCarthy's targets during that anti-communist crusade were guilty only of being linked at some point in their past, to some leftist group. That was 99.9% of them. Or they were guilty of being gay or appearing to be gay. So it's true that there were real Soviet spies, and we've talked about them today, uh, but I think it's the experience of that much larger group of people that explains why the Second Red Scare can properly be called a witch hunt that was motivated by a conspiracy theory. All right, thank you very much, and I will see you on Thursday. Thanks for listening to C-SPAN's Lectures in History podcast. If you're interested in hearing more history, check out Season 2 of the Presidential Recordings podcast. 
The second season focuses on taped conversations between President Richard Nixon on topics ranging from the Watergate scandal to his nominees for the Supreme Court. The Presidential Recordings Podcast is available wherever you get your podcasts.